Okay, hey, uh, welcome to the last lecture um, in this series. This is what this one we're going to try to put some things together on sustainability, materials, design, and cars, and show uh, the way loads of things uh, end up fitting together. And uh, I don't know, what, okay, got rid of the toolbar. Uh, okay, first let me go through some course logistics. Uh, first of all, we are down to the project. This is the last lecture. Um, there are points available for all of them, and I think I've put up on the board. Basically, the short story is if you've been in good standing with the courses and the course and the quizzes, if you do any kind of a project, um, you will get an A in the course. And basically, what a project means is either use material science content in your class or show what you're planning to do next year. And ideally, what we would like would be a lesson plan, uh, student examples on how the lesson went. And then um, the other uh, the other thing would be uh, 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 threw me off. The, the 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 last thing we would like to do is is have uh, a reflection on how the student work went. So um, if you want to do if you want to kind of bounce something off me in advance, the best way to do this would be to use the Carmen Dropbox and say here's about what I like to do. Upload a very short project proposal, what you'd like to do for the remainder of the grade. And um, I, I'm, I'm very flexible. I know some people can use material science this time. If you want to use the same stuff you're doing with the COSI things, that's fine as well. Um, and just as a reminder, um, this is the grade thing that we settled on at the beginning. I will be liberal with this, as I said. And then uh, the important thing is I can be a little bit flexible, but not very flexible with this. The, 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 the last day of winter quarter classes is Monday, April 22nd. I can stretch a little bit, but not too much on that. Hopefully there's no reason to really stretch too much, but uh, that's almost a month from now, and I'm sure we can get things all done from, from, from here to there. And um, I will be pulling all the grades together. I, I did that kind of midterm. I haven't been putting the discussion grades up lately. We'll do that again, see where everybody's at. Um, and I know there's only a few people that have completed up to the last lecture. So anyway, this is just a reminder of where we were. Um, that one I thought I didn't bring even here, even in, even in there. So anyway, la last time, uh, every time we talk about the homework problem we talked about la from before. So what we said is, uh, if you have a wire, a piece of copper, and this is something we might be able to do is make copper wire from malachite. Imagine if you get something that starts out one millimeter in diameter and uh, a mere 10 centimeters long and what happens how long would that wire be if we could get it down to 0.1 millimeters how long how long would that wire be if we could get to a diameter 0.1 millimeters and you should be able to do that with wire drawing it's pretty fine but you might be able to get there well basically um, what I say is the density of metal doesn't change uh, during plastic deformation, nor does the mass during that. So we can take this through draw dies. I think you've all in the materials camp seen how we can use draw plates to take a wire and make it finer and finer and finer. We get down to this 0.1 millimeters. And uh, basically I wrote this up on the next page. So the answer of this, if density and mass are fixed, so must be the volume. It has to be fixed. So the volume before is the volume after. So the volume before is 10 length times the area, pi r squared. It has to be the same as the new length, I'll call x, times new pi r squared. Solve for x. And what you end up finding is this thing that started as 10 centimeters has to end up as a coil of wire that have a total length of 10 meters and that's all just because um, as you go from point one, one millimeter point one millimeters area goes with radius squared so there's one one hundredth of the initial area you started with so the wire has to be a hundred times as long and that's the problem we had from last time okay that's that um, hit me with any questions on the discussion board uh, two things I want to hit is a couple recent discoveries. One, one is if you're teaching plastics and want to uh, link this to the real world, there's a, a really cool thing, and it happened on the uh, the podcast. 
at the Long Now Foundation, which is one of the geeky sites I tend to uh, listen to sometimes. Uh, she gives a, a wonderful story that's based on her book, Plastic, A Toxic Love Story. Um, she, Despite the title, she's actually uh, very balanced on the technology that she recognizes. There's a lot of good things that come from plastic. But among the stories that are told in there, um, it was a discovery of uh, basically the age of plastics, and it was in large part a an attempt to save the elephant. Elephants were being hunted just about to extinction for the ivory to make things like billiard balls and piano keys. A uh, contest was put forward. Celluloid was one of the early plastics developed. Then Bakelite came along soon after. Polyethylene, polycarbonate, all these plastics came out. Phenolics. Um, it re really, in, in the beginning of her lecture, is, is absolutely out outstanding of showing how Plastics came along, changed history, and uh, geeky materials people were, were all at the core of that. And in the early days, it seemed like it was an absolute home run for um, human uh, the, the human condition. And I think it really was, but there have been some unintended consequences, no doubt, things that we're still reeling with. And the latter part of the book and the latter part of the lecture apparently deal with that. The whole thing is excellent. I think the beginning part is absolutely... Uh, could be really really work well in ninth grade uh, science so um, I will leave that to you to look at if you like the other one that uh, just came unsolicited through uh, my YouTube feed is, is also really really good um, this is about Prince Rupert drops I told you about this is where if you take uh, basically you can take a piece of glass and this is done at a glass shop you don't need to do that you can take glass you can take a propane torch and if you're good at it, take the end of that propane torch, belt the glass, go into a bucket of water, and you make this little tadpole-looking thing called a Prince Rupert drop. And uh, let me see if I can... Um, let's see, I'm going to keep this. Bear with me for just a moment. I'll show you what this looks like. Um, this is... Um, This is a Prince Rupert drop. Basically, as I told you before, if you hit these things head on, the state of residual stresses will give it incredible strength. But if you break the tail, um, you can, you, they, they will fracture very easily and shatter. Yeah. And uh, oh! <laughs> so there so you go. There it is shattering. You broke it. I don't think you did. You think you broke it? I know I broke it. Let's look at high speed. <laughs> Okay, so the drop broke, but technically it wasn't the hammer that broke it. If you look close in the high speed, you can see that it's the wiggling of the tail that makes it go. This is the mystery of the Prince Rupert's drop. You can try as hard as you can to break the bowl, but you can't. But if you even nick the tail, the entire thing will explode. Not shatter, but actually explode. Let's go outside and I'll show you more. Okay, we're going to just run an obscene frame rate here. We have this Phantom V6. So skip frames per second. So can... Yeah, watch this. This is cool. I'm going to stop there. I'm sure that's way, way better if you watch it and native content versus what I have done. Uh, nonetheless, it's a great video on uh, Smarter Every Day. Really encourage that uh, big time. Um, and it's a demo you can do in your classroom. Uh, really great demonstration of residual stress. This is a technique that is used in glass all the time for strengthening it. And it puts all that residual stress in there that can uh, cause problems. Again, uh, the only thing I would do different is I think these guys are probably picking bits of glass out of their teeth and out of their face. I would not. They <laughs> tend to do those um, right, right, right by them, and, they, and they, these things do go with explosive force. Okay, on to the lecture. Um, here's what we want to do today. Is what we want to do is uh, consider automotive design. And uh, 
no kidding, Central Ohio is actually one of the meccas of automotive design uh, in the United States. Honda of America Motor Corporation has their, their North American operations just out here in Marysville and East Liberty. Um, they are as serious as any car company in the world, one of the absolute leading car companies just here. Your students can well be design engineers for Honda. Um, lots of people in the community are. They are really our, our home team with that. And I just want to work through a simple example, kind of sanitized for, uh, simplified is a better word, for ninth grade uh, use. And main things I want to do is say, how can we design a car and how can we choose materials? Oops. Um, how can we choose materials that, that really minimize total energy use and maximize sustainability and this is an important and not an intuitive thing um, everybody thinks that the Prius is probably the most sustainable car that is out there However, what they don't take into account is it takes a lot of energy to make that uh, nickel hydride battery I think it's still nickel hydride in the Prius lithium ions coming out these again take a lot of energy lightweight materials can take a lot of energy to you to, to put together if we are going to be smart as a species we want to consider the whole life cycle cost I'm going to give you a little way of doing that um, we'll also consider through this what challenges engineers come across when they're designing automobile bodies I could talk about this for days um, we're going to do it in uh, the remaining 45 minutes or so and then uh, We'll talk about how um, this can drive new research and materials, processes, and design. And again, I think the takeaway for your students are there are real jobs here in this community. Cool stuff goes on at Honda. And um, if it matters, if somebody would like to know more, I've got some great relationships there. We could probably pull some Honda people in to uh, help describe what goes on. It, it's hard to get them out for lots of class visits, but to do one video or something like that that might work for the whole group is, is very doable. Where would this fit? Uh, well, in the current timeline, um, this fits really well in terms of nature of science. Fits really well here in, in um, energy transformations. Also, can talk in forms of energy. Works works there in the the current uh, physical science timeline. If we go to what's coming new, um, it doesn't quite fit quite as well. It fits in here, you know, nicely in this energy section. Um, you know, when we're talking about generally how do we do this and how do we audit energy and you know energy and thermal energy and so forth if you look at next generation science standards I think this actually fits incredibly well what I'm going to show you here we're going to be using mathematical and computational thinking um, we're going to be designing solutions for engineers we're going to be engaging in argument from evidence um, we will be talking about energy and chemical processes in everyday life uh, talk a little bit about scale, proportion, and quantity, energy and matter flows. All of these things are really hit through this example. And on top of that, everybody rides in cars. Everybody's interested in cars. Um, I think it's a very sticky example, something that can be used to motivate your students. Well, this is a very complicated graph, and I, I tell you, I, I like complicated graphs, but if you take your time at them, um, you can uh, make sense of them. This is a, a Department of Energy. Lawrence Livermore puts out graphs like this regularly. This is where energy comes from. And we go, energy really is always conserved, but, but where, does it, where, where does it come from where you can harvest it? Well, here's solar. Um, I'll tell you, I can't even read that one. Hydro, wind, geothermal. These are fairly small. Natural gas is significant in growing. Coal is significant in growing. I think this one must be nuclear. Oh, it's bigger. Um, I, thought, I think it's bigger. This is biomass. This is petroleum. Must be nuke. And petroleum doesn't, very little of it goes into energy generation. Most of these others, or a lot of these others, go into energy generation. And then where does this go? Well, there's, as we showed, there's kind of, about a third goes into residential and commercial. This is basically heating and lighting our buildings. About a third goes into industrial processes. And about a third goes into transportation. And of that, about half of it is wasted off the bat, and about half of it is really used. So we can see that there are loads of ways uh, beyond just recycling cans and driving less that we can really reduce our energetic footprint. A lot of it is by coming up with more efficient processes. 
um, more efficient industrial processes, reducing the weight of our vehicle, reducing the fuel efficiency of our vehicle. And uh, these are the things that we will talk about. And uh, again, I would encourage you to uh, spend some time with these plots. They're, they're really not that difficult, but they are um, when you're trying to make make time uh, a little tricky. So the two ways we're going to talk about in this presentation that you can save vehicle weight, one is or you can reduce total energy use. One is by reducing vehicle weight. That will save energy used in transportation. The other one we're going to talk about is by making either more efficient processes or more intelligent material selections, we can reduce the amount of energy used in an industrial process. And there are huge amounts of energy used in industrial processes. We don't see it so much. We try to turn off the light, make sure our cell phone charger isn't plugged in and so forth. But um, this is invisible to us, but it's big as well. Um, the approach I'm going to use in part here is uh, given by Professor Mike Ashby. He has a wonderful, uh, he, he's done, a, his body of work is absolutely impressive. He's uh, one of these guys that uh, is, is one of my heroes. Um, and uh, he's got a couple of, couple of books on materials in the environment. He's done some other really wonderful work. Um, so I'm, I'm stealing his approach and his slides, and this is, uh, um, as I understand it, as I read the license, this is absolutely allowed because Ohio State is part of, uh, we, we use his software, we use his teaching material. And uh, this is one of the books that we use. I have a later edition that has a little different cover on it. And uh, what we're going to show, and uh, I'm going to take the, 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 make, the main ideas we don't need the book for, we're going to talk about materials consumption and a life cycle approach. We're going to talk about life cycle analysis which really is the right way I don't know if I did much by writing there which is really the right way for looking at global energy problems um, problems and solutions and that's the approach we're going to take in this lecture so here's um, and, and again um, logarithmic plots. This is a logarithmic plot of annual worldwide production of various materials. And so oil and coal sit here. And this is in units of tons per year. And if I go from here to here, just take a second. What does it mean if I go from here to here on a logarithmic scale? Well, if I go this far, it means it's 10x. So this means I produce about one-tenth as many tons of steel every year as I produce oil and coal. Um, big differences, and I and maybe there's about, it uh, looks like about 40 or 50 times more steel produced every year than there is aluminum. And there's, oh, let's see, fifth, uh, factor of five, 50, 500, 5,000, 50,000, um, 500,000 times more steel produced than there is gold. That's why gold is so darn uh, so darn valuable. Okay, so this is just production. Nothing, no no value along here. Just just label them out. Plastics we produce a lot of them. Similar amounts to to some of these uh, alloys that are like uh, aluminum, copper, zinc, and lead, for example produce a lot of lead, goes into batteries and so forth. And then the other one that we produce a huge amount of, concrete, asphalt, a fair bit of wood. Those are up there above aluminum. These are materials we often don't think too much about. But this, again, is really the big picture. And if you really want to think about the environment, you probably want to think about probably these some of these bigger materials. And that would be things probably like aluminum and above. That would include these plastics, concrete for sure, glass, wood. These are the things that we consume um, with, with abandon. So of these things, if we think about the chemistry, and you go and really think about the chemistry, we know, and we've done it in this class, or talked about it in this class, that our metals basically first come from rocks. So iron oxide, copper oxide, aluminum oxide, they all exist in nature, 
and we try to separate the oxygen from the metal and in the case of copper we, we do this with malachite we could do this with iron aluminum it turns out is very hard to separate titanium it's very hard to separate as a result it takes a lot of energy actually to make aluminum and titanium in particular so we can go and um, look at this and, and say okay of these materials we can how much carbon release to the atmosphere is there in terms of ton per year tons per year and what are the big ones again steel cast iron aluminum alloys are big plastics are significant culprits not nearly so big as these guys concrete's a huge deal um, and uh, almost as much as steel papers actually a big deal more more so even than aluminum alloys so that's another way to look at this so if you're really concerned about carbon emissions and energy um, you could do a very similar plot for energy these are the kind of plots you want to worry about you want to make sure that you're dealing with the big problems not necessarily the really small problems smaller problems down here which you may say that they're not they're not small but going up this is 10 times 10 times bigger 100 times bigger and these are sort of in the 1% problems where these are the 99% problems all big so what we're going to do is consider the product life cycle whenever you buy something whenever you manufacture something um, there's a life cycle to it we want to do a life cycle analysis this is the idea let's capture the big picture do a holistic analysis and um, whenever we're going to make something we take natural resources make it into a material for example malachite rocks make it into copper when we do that we have feedstocks that come in energy that comes in they're transported in you produce the material and the steaming pile is emissions and waste which includes waste energy emissions all of that kind of stuff and so resources go in waste goes out and you get material out and of that material that comes out that material can be used as a product manufacturer when you make a product feedstocks go in energy materials waste comes out there's a process efficiency and that's what we as material scientists often deal with how do we do this in the most efficient way possible that is huge huge value in these in these careers no kidding product is then used and when we use a product you've got an automobile for example energy feedstocks go in wiper fluid oil gasoline mostly gasoline waste comes out waste heat um, tailpipe emissions all that then you get to the your car gets to the end of its life and when your car gets to the end of its life what might happen to it well it might just go into the landfill it just might be become part of that stinking seething pile you might take it and combust it if you have something like a, a polyethylene uh, milk jug you might take that and combust it you might take that polyethylene jug you might recycle it or you might refurbish it or upgrade it and uh, and, and use it again and that's probably the, the most uh, ecological thing you can do some materials recycle very very well a great example is aluminum most of the aluminum that's ever been made from ore is still in production we take the cans they're very recyclable it takes a lot of energy to make it but it can be recycled very easily at the other end of the spectrum are things like composites made on thermosetting plastics they're very difficult to recycle and that book that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture about plastics and the toxic love story it also makes the case that many plastics are very recyclable but even the recyclable ones are generally not recycled very efficiently they're very uh, with with great gusto a lot of it just goes into waste so that's the product life cycle and then the other thing you might recycle refurbish or you might even reuse what you have that's the life cycle we want to capture what goes on with that we do that with this life cycle assessment is basically the tool we're going to use to do that and I'm going to give you a very simple version of a life cycle assessment something I think could be used nicely in a ninth grade classroom so this is sort of a typical life cycle assessment um, you might say okay I'm gonna make a thousand cans we know I've got to bring in so much bauxite that's basically the, the the native iron ore that we are aluminum ore that we start with to make a thousand aluminum cans you need about 120 pounds of bauxite 
you need a lot of oil, you need a lot of feedstocks, you have all these emissions, um, you got all these things that happen. It's really complicated to take all of that into account. That's not necessarily the way we want to do things. So resources are consumed, emissions we can be we can take inventory of, impact assessments we can do. How do you put all those on a leveling on a level playing field? It's not easy. So a full life cycle assessment using all these things is time consuming, expensive, and requires great detail on multiple metrics and even then it's subject to uncertainty. So what we're going to do is do a simpler, somewhat simpler approach and um, you know something a designer can't much can't do much with these so instead what we're going to do is roll this into a single eco indicator and there are three things I would say we can use as eco indicators. One is energy do a full energy life cycle analysis. That's the approach we're going to take here. Second, we can do the whole thing on carbon emissions. That's another way to do things. And um, we, we could try to minimize our carbon footprint. The third thing we could do is we could basically do the same sort of thing on cost, but the problem with that, you really have to have government policy aligned with whatever you're doing so that the costs make sense in the end, and, and they often don't. So as a result of that, we're not going to consider cost in our analysis today. So this is um, generally agreed this bigger thing is unworkable. We're going to use this instead. This does work. Put a smiley face by that because the, the, the rolling up into one eco indicator works. So this is the strategy we're going to use for doing this. We're going to do an eco audit that combines acceptable costs with precision to guide decision making. Um, we're going to consider one resource, energy, one emission, CO2. There are other ways this could be done. Distinguish the life phases. The life phases we're going to consider are these. The material takes a certain amount of energy to create. Once you have the material, it takes a certain energy to manufacture it. Very often you have something that's made someplace shipped over here one of the most egregious, egregious examples of this egregious examples try one more time is uh, plywood for the United States consumption is often made in China um, it takes a lot of energy to make it it also takes a lot of energy to ship plywood from China to here and you know provided it hasn't rotted on the way and you still need it when you need it when it, when it gets here but transport can be a big deal particularly if you're making something in a remote location and using it here. Um, so plywood from China might get here by a boat, but lots of products could get here by air freight. And it turns out air freight burns a lot of energy as well. So if you're uh, bringing the plywood over by air freight, um, that's, that's a big deal. Use is a big deal. And then what happens at end of life, you might either dispose of that thing or you might recover it. And so we can have these one, two, three, four, five stages of life. And we can consider um, we can consider energy and or um, carbon footprint impacts at each stage of life. Okay, that's the, that's the way we're going to do this. And again, at the ninth grade level, I think this is a very useful way of thinking. It shows how you can put numbers to something, the value of putting numbers to something, but uh, you don't necessarily have to put numbers to it. So um, if you consider an airplane. It turns out um, the, the number of gallons of fuel that uh, something like a 737 burns in its lifetime are just enormous. These are basically machines that are created to burn, to burn fuel. You put in hundreds of gallons every time a 737 takes off, and so the use phase dwarfs everything else. And if you can do anything to reduce how much energy that airplane will burn, um, that's a big, big financial environmental win. Uh, for something like a car, use is, is the biggest part, but materials, manufacturing, transportation, these can be significant also. And I'll show you an example at the end where the materials part can actually be a big, big, big part of that. Um, if you consider an appliance, um, the materials that go into it can be significant. Again, use is probably 
uh, going to be the dominant thing. And if it turns out, you know, you could put in some, some very fancy insulation. You could probably run this down, but maybe it would, would increase the um, amount of material energy that would go into the product. Uh, something like a car park, um, not very much goes into in use, but the materials is huge. Again, as I showed at the beginning, the amount of the amount of energy that it takes to make concrete is massive, and uh, as a result of that, there's there's a lot of carbon footprint in just putting up that car park. So um, uh, this is a, a big deal, and there are more. There are probably more environmentally friendly ways of doing this. Just laying gravel down onto a field. If you can do that, certainly wouldn't have the impact of building this massive concrete and steel structure. Private house, um, you, you burn a lot more energy. There's a use phase, insulation matters. Uh, the materials that go into it also matter. You can put concrete, brick, wood into that. All those things have footprints associated with manufacturing and transport. Take some, but not, not a massive amount unless you're uh, importing your uh, granite countertops from Italy or something like that. Those might have a lot of transportation energy associated with them. Um, something like a carpet doesn't burn much in use, maybe vacuuming it. Transportation a little bit, but materials making those Orlon fibers or whatever they are is where, where it's all at. So anyway, you can, you can do all these things. And then, of course, um, what happens at the end of life is, is, is also important. So what we can do is, um, you know, do, do the eco audit, and uh, there is a, this Cambridge material selector that I'm kind of taking this from, but we're not going to go into. Formally goes into this. You can do the audit. You can consider the material, uh, how much energy is in the part, and that's um, in terms of kilojoules per kilogram. You can also look at how much CO2 is, is consumed. You can consider the manufacturing process, casting or sheet metal forming, machining, so forth. You can consider transport, um, how far it goes, how much energy it takes to get the, the get something from one place to the other, what goes on in, in use, for example, in the car, how much energy do you burn, an airplane, how much fuel do you burn, and then there's the last part, disposal. What do you do with this at the end? And disposal can be plus or minus. The rest of these are all minus. These are all doing, doing uh, net damage. There's disposal, you can get a net positive out of that. So the big one I mentioned before is embodied energy. And uh, this is embodied energy. This is megajoules, how many megajoules per kilogram it takes to make something. And again, this is just a list on a logarithmic scale. So going from here to here, uh, so going from there, to there, that distance is 100x. So it basically takes 100 times more energy to take to make a kilogram of titanium than it does to make a kilogram of cement. That said, we make a lot more cement than we make titanium. So this is uh, making cement actually dwarfs uh, the energy in titanium. So some of these alloys, um, you know, aluminum is, is, is fairly high up here. Plastics are, are moderate. Uh, steels actually don't take a whole lot of energy to create, surprisingly. They are, are relatively um, relatively friendly that way. Um, this is, most of these plastics, it's basically because the, 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 you, you, there is, they're, they're basically hydrocarbons themselves. That's where their embodied energy comes from. Um, Technical ceramics take a lot of energy to make. Some of these more natural ceramics don't take so much to make. Plaster on a per pound basis doesn't take a whole lot to do. And then polymer or polymer composites can basically be all over the map. Um, big comparisons I'd like to make would be steels we'll talk about are fairly energy efficient to create. Uh, things like carbon reinforced plastic takes a lot of energy to make. Aluminum takes a lot of energy to make, but a big difference between aluminum and carbon reinforced plastic is aluminum is easily recyclable, easily recycled. Steel is also fairly easily recycled, not quite as often recycled because it doesn't have the value aluminum does. So something like carbon reinforced plastic is very hard to recycle. 
you can get some value out of it but not very much so this takes a lot of energy to make and at the same time um, doesn't give you much back so that, that's a that's a problem okay and uh, this just kind of shows this is a, a line about through the middle of the plastics this is on a per pound or per kilogram basis a per mass basis I can do the same thing uh, okay I can do the same thing on a per volume basis and I don't know why the I don't know why the uh, pen marks persisted but anyway you can see now um, this used to be you know, st steels are up here on a per per meter basis with with uh, plastics simply because the steels are more dense than the plastics it's kind of a small point point that I really want to make is this data is out there it is kind of tough sledding for ninth grade but I think in a few select examples it can make sense but it is nice to see that that there is this world of data out there that can allow people to make uh, rational decisions and I tell you with the age of Google if you know how to use the data it's sure as easy to get it um, so anyway this this again just shows production energy on a per kilogram basis production energy on a on a per per uh, volume basis and this is just a family of all kinds of data that exists in this Cambridge material selector software more data than you really need so with this software Cambridge engineering selector CES um, this is the way you can run a formal energy audit you can put in user inputs um, you have data that exists in there from that you can get an eco audit you can get tabular data and you can do this so you can do this by hand in a rough way or you can use uh, software to do this more formally and this is something that we are now teaching all of our undergraduates uh, that this kind of use of data is something that uh, we think is, is pretty important so it's part of our, our former formal curriculum here at Ohio State so this is kind of an interesting example if we consider just how much if, if you want a nice cold bottle of water um, how much energy does that take and it, it turns out you know just drinking water from the tap is a pretty environmentally friendly thing to do but if you're gonna make a bottle uh, there's actually a fair bit of embodied energy right in that in that bottle takes a little bit of energy to blow mold that depending on where it comes from it takes something uh, use would be basically putting that bottle in the refrigerator cooling it down and then if you do recycle it possibly you can get much of that material content back and that saves you something um, so this is energy this is carbon footprint with recycling gives you a very similar similar uh, thing with recycling other end-of-life things you could do you could combust this if you combust it and just burn it to try to get something back you don't get nearly as much out as if you recycle versus if you if you basically put it the incinerator and this is how much carbon if you combust and basically uh, you take that thing you turn it into carbon so you you're, you have a, a pretty pretty high footprint if you do that best footprint of all drink out of the tap that's that's your best way to go uh, eco augit for a, a kettle something like this uh, the big thing is you have this thing in the wall and if you use this very much that's the dominant thing and if you can insulate this a little better make it a little more efficient that's probably going to save you uh, the most so a um, little design by changing material much gain by insulation foam or vacuum so forth okay so now what I want to do is take this thinking and uh, turn it to the example of an automobile and right now uh, the people in Washington have put into effect corporate average uh, I think average fleet economy standards and by 2025 the law says we're going to be driving cars that on average get 55 miles per gallon how do we do this and this is a good thing and this is right now all that's mandated and it's not a bad thing but it's kind of a short-sighted thing and that's the way things happen in Washington sometimes how do we do this can we afford this um, is it a good idea um, and then one thing we know at, at very least everybody who makes cars and I know a lot of people that make cars all agree that cars are gonna have to be lighter if we're gonna get to this 
They may also have to do things like use hybrids quite a bit. We may need to use natural gas. So there's, there's all kinds of things that are going on. Um, but the one thing that's clear is they're going to have to be lighter. So what I want to do is, is take one piece of what we had there, and this is valuing mass reduction. And, um, you know, right now we think about miles per gallon. Is miles per gallon really the right way to measure the efficiency of a vehicle? Well, it's, it's not a bad way, but it's not the ultimate way. So, example, if you're comparing, um, say, a little two-seater Sportster to a uh, school bus, which, which is the more efficient vehicle? Well, a school bus gets really low miles per gallon, but I can sit 60 people on it. So if I do it per person mile, the bus is way more efficient than, than uh, my little, uh, little two-seater two Sportster. So miles per gallon is a little bit uh, not necessarily the right thing to do. So so the way I'm going to do this is try to give this what I think is a, a, a pretty good metric. And this is how much energy, how many kilojoules does it take to send one kilogram an extra kilometer. And this is a metric. It's, again, kind of a complicated unit. Kilojoules, a unit of energy per kilogram per kilometer. And if I go to Mike Ashby's book again, I can... I can get data on how many kilojoules it takes to send something a, a kilometer. And I know that a gallon of gasoline takes 130,000 kilojoules is what you get out of a gallon of gasoline. So you can figure out how many extra gallons of gas it takes to, to push things, push extra mass around. So um, you can see diesel ocean, ocean shipping is a really efficient way, way to do things like 0.1 diesel rail same kind of ballpark you know point two ish heavy trucks long haul trucks pretty good you know between point four and one personal auto they're not quite as efficient we're not built to to add extra weight so you can see this is on the order one this is about ten times greater than this if i get something by fedex by air freight um you know this is <laughs> again way more di way way more uh, energy inefficient by you know factors of almost a hundred between what we had for uh, diesel rail shipping to air freight from point two to twenty factor of a hundred less efficient so when you get something from FedEx there's a significant carbon footprint associated with that and if you're dealing like uh, at the front lines of Iraq where things are dropped in by helicopter it takes a whole lot of energy to move an extra pound an extra bit of distance okay so if I've got a helicopter, and, or let's imagine air freight. I'm going to use something like a 737. I want to ask the question, well, if I pull, say, 100 pounds out of a 737 and, uh, and do that by putting new seats into the 737 airplane, is, is that, how, how, much, how much value is that going to buy me? So, so what I can do is say, okay, I know that how many kilojoules I save, by taking an extra kilogram, extra kilometer. So say I save 100 kilograms, for example, um, and a plane flies, say, something like 10 million uh, kilometers, you start talking about really big energies by saving a little bit of mass in it. This is why weight reduction is such a powerful thing. I can put this on a log log plot will probably make your head, head hurt a little bit. But this is this transport energy that I had down here. 0 0.1, 1, 100, uh, 0.1, 1, 10, 100. Buses are pretty efficient, economy cars, helicopters are out here. I can have this on this axis. And how far something might go is shown on this axis. This is a million kilometers, 10 million kilometers, um, and 100 million kilometers. And this shows you that for things like aircraft, they burn a lot of fuel, takes a lot of fuel to take things an extra distance. They go tens of millions of kilometers. So if I pull a pound out, I can save about 3,000 liters of fuel if I pull out just one kilogram of material. And as a result of that, I could save on the order of $1,500 for reducing a pound out of a 737. Um, this is absolutely real, and people at aircraft companies will tell you this. This is why materials are so so important, is 
these these changes, you know, these in-flight magazines they put in the 737s, the energy costs and just shipping those magazines, accelerating those and decelerating those every time is massive. But uh, I think you know they're, they're making pretty good money on uh, Air Mall and all of that. And this is also why that they do care if you carry uh, more than 50 pounds or such in your carry-ons. So anyway, um, here's another log scale. This is cost on a per pound basis, going for a dollar per pound, ten dollars per pound, hundred dollars, thousand dollars per pound, ten thousand dollars per pound. On the bottom here, I've got a graph different materials, going from really cheap stuff like concrete to really expensive stuff like gold and platinum. You can see they're they're all over the spectrum. Um, Aluminum is, is reasonably inexpensive in the whole scheme of things. Carbon fiber is actually pretty expensive. Um, diamonds, platinum, gold up here at the really expensive side. And then on top of this, I can have vehicles. And I've got my cheap vehicles. About as, and I'm doing this on, again, on a dollar per pound basis. If I go to Walmart, buy a cheap bike from a Chinese labor camp, um, that'll cost me something about uh, $4 a pound. Uh, very inexpensive, you know, 30 pound bike for 120 bucks, something like that. Uh, if I buy something like an Accord, they they typically price out about seven or eight dollars a pound. Um, if I go to a commercial jet, they actually price out, take the cost of the jet divided by the pounds of the jet, about a thousand dollars a pound. Formula One racers are a little more than that. Uh, high end bicycles, a little less than that. So th th this is all related to what I talked about before. You, you, th th these things that are really kind of high performance vehicles. There's a reason for putting very high tech materials in them. Um, we can afford them, and there's 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 really great value in doing that. These things down here, not quite as much value in that, but still pretty significant. And these also tend to be things that we make at lower volumes, things like cars and bikes we make it at fairly high volumes okay maybe a little tricky but uh, this is um, uh, kind of a favorite plot of mine so so anyway the, let's go forward think about how we make cars again what we want to do as best we can and you know cars are made by companies companies want to make money that's really important they're, they're also they also want to be good environmental stewards if they can but they have to make money or they don't stick around so in order to make money, what they want to really do is favor these inexpensive materials down here. Things steel is is really favored, for example, over aluminum, simply because steel is cheaper than aluminum. Um, magnesium is is lighter than aluminum; it costs even more. Carbon fiber is really light; costs a lot more. So again, steel is a dominant player. You're seeing more and more aluminum, more and more magnesium. Uh, plastic is coming into the mix, it has to be reinforced, often reinforced by things like carbon. Um, this makes for interesting challenges. So this is the way we make cars today, um, or the early ones were made up basically on a ladder frame, and, and this is still what you see in pickup trucks today, old pickup trucks. Uh, old Model T was basically built on a frame, everything mounts to the frame, you're good to go. That works, steel's a great frame material. Uh, modern vehicles, what we do is make them out of steel, and uh, the steel is generally getting stronger, and if it gets stronger, we can make it thinner. If we make it thinner, it actually gets gets elastically less stiff because the stiffness of steel doesn't change with strength, just the strength changes. But uh, we make it thinner, make it lighter, and we use different steel grades, and the really impressive stuff for the cabin of the vehicle, this red stuff, very high strength steel this 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 is featured in the cab and that's what keeps us safe basically that keeps the whole cab from from crushing on us whereas this stuff out here we actually want to make weak because this is for controlled crush out here controlled crush back here and that's the way we design the vehicle and um, that's how we keep ourselves safe so what's going to happen in the future well i think there's two paths we might see with automobiles in the future um, first of all, um, everybody's going to try to take something like, and there's a really great EPA study. If you look on EPA study, put Lotus EPA or uh, FEV uh, study, you can see uh, thousands of pages were done on the Venza where they consider every part, can we make it a little bit lighter? And they said, yeah, we can probably make it about 30% lighter if we're really careful. It would still like, look like a kind of a conventional car. And this is by and large what the big uh, car companies are doing. There's another 
approach that's going on. This is an approach, Oliver Kuttner is the CEO of a company called Edison 2. Um, back in 2010, they won a $5 million X prize by demonstrating this is a four passenger vehicle. You can get four guys in here. Um, and you can get 100 miles per gallon with this. The way they did this is making the car very light, get very aerodynamic, and uh, this is basically a steel frame, tube, steel tube frame that did this. Really a nice piece of engineering, but you can't quite get there with the conventional architecture. And I'll say a little bit more about the architecture in a little bit. But, you know, there's these incremental approaches to the future and these disruptive approaches to the future. And I think they're both very important, very important for students to know that this is the way the world is going. Some really big things are happening. Again, students can be part of it. Um, you know, looking at material, you know, basic, looking at vehicle topology, there's a lot of neat things going on. There's tube frames going on. Um, this is uh, a, a carbon monocoque. Monocoque. Monocoque is what that should say. Um, this is a... Uh, an Italian car, I think that's a Lamborghini. Lotus does some really cool things with aluminum. This is a, a design they put out some years ago. This is a Lotus Elise. And these are highly aluminum. This is carbon. This is steel tubes. There are a lot of ways of doing really light things. All, all different design philosophies. But the thing, if you're going to mass produce something, it has to be uh, easy to make. And this is a multi-material concept that's easy to make, mixes aluminum, um, high-strength components, steel, all kinds of stuff put together. This is a concept car that was shown uh, a few years ago in L.A. Um, ideas like this are moving towards production. And really the key idea is we use the best material in the best uh, in, in, a, in a location to take advantage of what it's good for. The structural composites are wicked light really highly high cost these are high hot stamped high strength steels are what we make the cabin out of they avoid avoid crush in the passenger zone magnesium castings are outstanding a magnesium almost floats um, a density of, of like 1.8 or something like that and aluminum um, really is very high strength good um, low density and also very recyclable so all of these things will be in cars of the future and um, how we put all this together could be another presentation. So again, this is sort of what a car might be put together. You're going to see aluminum, steel, aluminum, aluminum extrusions, magnesium castings, for example. These all come together. What I want to do is I want to close on a very specific example and uh, think about the family car. And what I really want to do is consider a trade-off of two parts, material energy and use energy. And, um, again, there's big differences in how much energy it takes to produce, for example, steels versus um, carbon-reinforced composites. So big differences, about a factor of 50 or better in between. So um, I can take, for example, this Edison 2 geometry. Here it's shown with the skin on. Here it's shown with the skin off. Let's consider a major component. Let's consider this this big front support right here that the blue arrow is on. Let's say, imagine right now that thing is made out of steel. And um, let's say that uh, I could make this out of a uh, carbon reinforced fiber, carbon fiber reinforced composite, and I could even make it out of a part that looks like this. This is a product called AirCore. Um, that's been developed that can make beams like this. And let's say steel um, right now is 50 kilograms in a car because it has a high density, you know, modest elastic modulus, and, and, and fairly high strength. What I could do is take carbon composite, fabricate it into a shape like that, which is really efficient, has a much lower density, higher modulus, higher strength, so I could replace this with this and go from maybe uh, 50 pounds per car 20 pounds per car, so a delta of about 30 kilograms. Well, is that a good thing? Is that a thing I should do? 
um, even if uh, even if it makes uh, and even if the the design engineers say yeah you can do that the manufacturer says yeah guys say yeah I can do that do I want to do that well um, so this is again um, maybe the broader picture of what we might be able to do if you're making something like this you could have you know reinforced skin high strength steel cabin magnesium cast bulkheads um, you know, uh, one of these air core things that goes across the front. This could be a very disruptive way of making the vehicle of the future. It could be super light, very fuel efficient. We could easily meet CAFE standards or something like this. Again, the trick to this, actually, uh, go back to the other slide. The trick to making this thing work is this is a very aerodynamic shape. Normally what you'd have is you'd have a shock absorber that would come up here and you'd need some kind of big support that creates a lot of extra volume, a lot of wind resistance. And that's one of the tricks by going to this alternate vehicle topology that makes that allows you to to get uh, to get that. So we can further innovate based on that. Okay, so imagine we can do that. Question is, to put it very succinctly, should we replace this 50 kilogram structural steel piece with a 20 kilogram piece that's made out of carbon reinforced plastic? Um, so based on the Ashby plot, I can say the mass rate of energy consumption of this car so for every extra um, for every extra kilometer I go for the extra kilogram it's going to cost me five kilojoules of energy that's something I can get kind of a reference value so I know how much energy is saved by having a lower mass vehicle and let's say um, I know my steel production cost is 30 megajoules per kilogram carbon fiber might cost me 600 megajoules per kilogram. So the energy cost is going to be um, the, the old the new energy new energy minus the old energy which would be 600 megajoules per kilogram times what did I say 20 kilograms minus 30 megajoules per kilogram times 50 kilograms and then um, based on that I can say okay I've saved in the end I save about a thousand megajoules in the end I'm sorry I saved about 10,000 megajoules and it's all worked out on the next page so this is what I had before. This is the energy cost in production. It cost me this much to make. This much I no longer have to make. So 9,500 megajoules is, is how much extra energy goes in to making the material. So then I know I'm going to save energy, but how far do I have to drive? Because I've gone up here. How, how, much, how far do I have to drive that down? Well, I know this is my rate. So um, this multiplied by my cost savings of uh, my, my mass savings of 30 kilograms is my mass savings turns out I've got to drive about 63,000 kilometers or 40,000 miles before I even break even so you will break even the mass savings does help but if you're using material like that it doesn't help as much as you as you think um, aluminum also takes a lot more energy to produce than steel but Aluminum you can recycle much more easily than this carbon reinforced plastic. So you know, what about recycling? We talked about that. It's a problem. So we can consider other alternatives to just those that I mentioned. Um, aluminum is is a good one. Okay, I hope that makes makes some sense. Um, it's a lot in that lot in that lecture. So I'm going to close there. Um, so basically, what we talked about is how can we design and choose materials to minimize energy use and maximize sustainability on a life cycle basis talk that through gave you some tools you can make this quantitative with your kids um, we also showed what challenges engineers come across for designing automobile bodies uh, we can go into a lot more detail with that um, again uh, I think in central Ohio here the thing you should know is this is a lot of automotive manufacturers a lot of jobs for engineers a lot of people employed in this and and both in places like Honda and their suppliers and there's also room for lots of research uh, when you're doing this if you're going to try to put together um, systems 
like this where you've got all kinds of all kinds of materials playing various roles for example where I say you got magnesium high strength steel all these things coming together <coughs> we don't know how to weld all these things you're going to put them together we do know how to weld steel together so there's lots of room for research lots of rooms for cool things to happen and um, and I think I think that's it I think that that uh, we we accomplished what we uh, set out to do I look forward to seeing your comments on the board look forward to seeing your progress on the uh, projects and look forward to seeing you guys at COSI again soon and um, that's it over and out for now we'll uh, we'll talk soon and let's see if I can remember how to turn this off okay hey uh, happy uh, happy what is it March and uh, welcome back um, recording from my bedroom studio here um, so what I'm going to talk today about is, is really manufacturing, and it's really a, a very central topic. And uh, before I do that, we'll go through standards a little bit more and where things are at and where they're going and show how this fits. And I, I, I think it does probably more future standards than it does today, and we'll, we'll hit, hit that in a little bit. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, last time we were at, I gave, I think, the hardest quantitative problem I've given so far. And I asked the question that uh, let's do an experiment where what you do is you have a styrofoam cup of water and you've got a hundred milliliters of water in it which is equal to 100 grams of water in there and uh, so there's your water what I'm gonna do is take a block of something either aluminum or lead take a hundred grams of it and I'm gonna take that to hundred degrees C and then I'm gonna put that in there and what's going to happen is heat's going to transfer out of the metal into the, li the liquid and uh, basically Q out of the metal is going to be equal to the, the Q in to the liquid or maybe I'm going to use W water for, for that so that's basically the heat transfer out of one and in and, and one of the big themes physical sciences energy heat is conserved somehow and uh, so that's a good way to do that so basically you start off initially this water is at 25 degrees C this is at 100 degrees C and then when it's all said and done they all come to some equilibrium temperature after afterwards so the water is going to heat up that the and the the metal will cool down and they'll both end up at the same temperature so mathematically the way we can the way we can state that is that the change in temperature of the water is going to be equal uh, I'm sorry plus the change in temperature of the metal is going to be equal to 75 degrees C they're 75 degrees C apart so what I can say is the change in the temperature of the metal is equal to 75 minus change in temperature of the water so the water is going to cool down the metal is going to heat up and uh, that's what's that's what's going to happen so I can this equation can be used so I'm going to use superscripts um, just to, to, to keep metal versus water and then I can expand this equation to say that um, Q in for the water or Q out for the water is going to be equal to delta T for the water times the heat capacity of the water times the mass of the water is equal to the change in temperature of the metal heat capacity of the metal mass of the metal and both the masses are equal to 100 grams so actually you can divide these out those divide off on both sides those go away and what's really interesting is the heat capacity of water by definition is one calorie per gram per degrees C per degrees K and um, if you look at aluminum it's about a fifth of that if you look at lead on a per gram basis it's about three percent of that so you can run that through and basically just make the substitutions into the equation so this is um, delta T sub M this term ends up here 
and what you end up with is the following is delta T is water times CP water which is equal to 1 is equal to um, 75 times uh, 75 this thing 75 minus delta T W C P M that thing and then all it is just an algebra problem from that from that point on what you find then is for uh, the aluminum delta T water is equal to about 13 degrees not very much for the lead, since it has a, so much a smaller heat capacity, it's delta T W is only about two degrees, much much smaller amount. Um, so that that is actually a fairly um, lengthy problem, I think, for the ninth grade. But it does show you know algebra. It's a little bit of a, you know semi advanced algebra. It's a real problem, and it's one that you could very very easily do in your classroom very nicely. Um, again showing the power of math and if anybody has further questions uh, put them up on the on the board we'd be uh, happy to be happy to talk through them and uh, should have left myself in a little more room to, to deal with that so anyway that that's from last time so let's go on to new material um, what I want to do is, is again kind of connect everything back to standards and um, where we're at right now this is what's going on this year in, um, in in physical science and the places that we really tend to do a lot of material science kind of nature of science and engineering we do a little bit with motion and force um, you know classification of matter we we hit big chemical bonds and reactions we hit significantly and uh, inter interactions of matter we can do a, a fair bit with but I think everybody is aware that changes are afoot in the way science is being taught and you know since I'm not a high school science teacher I, I know about this kind of in the abstract much more than um, that, than I think you guys and I think it's a whole lot of people who might listen to this that are a whole lot more expert on this than me but let me give you my my take and show where things fit well first of all um, you know we're working on a new um, new curriculum for Columbus City for 2014 for ninth grade physical science this is a working draft for that it's it's really fairly similar a lot of the same things will fit atoms classifications of matter periodic table these are core things where material science can be used we've done some nice labs on electricity that fits reaction of matters fits bonding and compounds so, so material science can be very strong up through here again um, Forces work great with springs. We can hit this with springs, and then there's a lot we can do with thermal energy, for example, what we just what we just talked about. So that's what's going to happen in um, Columbus City next year. And this is absolutely a draft, but we are trying to make material science be sort of a unifying unifying thread that would run through much of this. And uh, you'll see how that goes. I think one example might be using, for example. Uh, uh, malachite to copper to make copper and then take and process that copper into something useful well the other thing that's happening is we're going towards next generation science standards and this is a national a national thing and uh, this is based on on three things and, and I think it's still unfolding so far as I can tell exactly what's going to be taught in what grade and it looks like there'll be a lot of discretion as to what goes where um, in, in for example high school you know you're supposed to come out of eighth grade at a certain level and then what happens in high school happens over that period uh, physical science will likely still sit in, um, in ninth grade but this is um, what things look like and there's three three things there, there, there's there's practices and by the way this comes from an article um, in, in science teacher there's practices there's core disciplinary ideas in the physical sciences and then there are cross-cutting concepts and I think material science can actually play a really really strong role in all of this um, for example everything we're doing is very hands-on so planning and carrying out investigations is a big deal analyzing and interpreting data we can do quite a job with uh, something that I've been really hitting hard is mathematics and computational thinking um, and I 
think that absolutely belongs with science. Math is the language of science, um, and, and an amazingly uh, predictive one. Um, the other thing that's in there is, is uh, constructing explanations for science and designing solutions in engineering. And this is something that we're going to hit hard today, is designing solutions um, and making stuff as part of that. And then uh, when we look at the core disciplinary ideas, really chemical reactions are one that we, we end up hitting hard. Forces in motion, we can do a fair bit with springs and so forth. Stability and instability, even melting in what phases are present is really a statement of stability. Uh, conservation of energy and energy transfer, we will deal a fair bit with energies and forces. Um, chemical processes in everyday life, and I consider everyday life to con consider ma uh, to include manufacturing. And this one we're going to uh, see in a, a big sense in a little bit. And then when we get to cross-cutting uh, concepts. I think patterns is, is sort of one. You know, look at crystals; they're they're very patterned. It's a little different way than they're talking about pattern here. One that's really important is scale, proportion, and quantity. When we talk about microstructure, back earlier in this course, that's one that that fits in really well. Um, structure and function is is, is huge. Um, again, we microstructure is what it is. We make objects into shapes uh, for, for particular reasons. And then stability and change. Microstructure, what happens when we anneal something and so forth, this also uh, is really important. Also that couples in with, with energy and energy flows and so forth. So material science really fits all over this the whole approach that we're talking about that's been developed through the ASM Education Foundation I think um, has a lot to do with all of this. So anyway the the stuff that's going to be in, in today's lecture I think actually fits these next generation science standards better than it does um, some of the current stuff but it, it doesn't do really a bad job on the current stuff either. So what are we going to do today? Well, today what we're going to do is um, do this on manufacturing and making stuff. Um, all around us, the stuff that we use is designed and manufactured. And manufacturing is a big cross-cutting word. It has a lot to do with a lot of things, including energy, the economy, jobs, all of that. What it really is, is manufacturing in its end is a way of not wasting money, or I say cheaply, producing a controlled chemistry, shape, and microstructure. That's really what we're doing. Um, the processes that go into making almost anything, a beverage can, a light bulb, um, a pencil, uh, automobile, a tire on an automobile, the spring in the seat in your car, the, the talents that it takes to make something lowly, like the spring in the seat in your car, and get the coatings on it, and the design and everything, it, it's really awesome. And there's a lot of jobs tied up in that, and there's a lot of technology, and um, you know, doing it economically is really important. Huge number of people are involved in this thing, which is really a technical activity, it requires many skills, and I think materials are an absolute key to the process. And um, this activity is really connected to the, our economy and the rest of, of our way of life, and that's why I want to hit manufacturing here and again I think it hits really cleanly into a lot of the, the upcoming next generation science standards and, and it, it hits today as well but but really really it resonates with what's coming so just to show um, kind of uh, this is a real big picture plot and this is one I could spend a whole lecture on Actually, this whole lecture here I could could roll into a whole course um, but energy sustainability, this comes from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. What they ask is, where does energy come from? And things come from solar a little bit, uh, nuclear a little bit, hydro a little bit, wind. Natural gas is big, coal is big, petroleum is huge, biomass is significant. Um, and then where does this energy end up going? Well, a lot of this energy, you know, like natural gas and coal and so forth, end up going into, into electricity generation, for example. Some, like petroleum, coal is used directly. And then where does it go? Well, you know, energy is one of these things that's conserved. This is a core idea in physical science. And of that energy, a lot of it is lost straight off, about half of it. 
and um, a lot of it goes to do its job. And then there are three basic places it goes. About a third goes to heat and light our homes, be they residences or commercial buildings. About a third, roughly, goes into transportation. And about a third actually goes into making stuff, into making aluminum, running, running the plants that it takes to make our cars. So this is about one-third uh, buildings, one-third, you know, processes, things like making fiberglass, making cement, cement and, and we could actually break this down tremendously. Cement is, is one that's huge. Pulp and paper is huge. Metalworking and metal refining uh, in particular is huge. And then transportation we all know about. This is what, uh, you know, what we talk about when we talk about fuel economy and so forth. This is about a third. And these are all huge, 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 huge numbers that all kind of go into this into this plot. Well, today what we're going to talk about really is, 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 is this part. Next week we're going to talk some about this part. We're going to talk about these processes that consume about a third of the energy we use as a country. And that's based on making stuff of various sorts. I think I've got some other things to flip on there. So, you know, one thing we could do is if we're smart with materials, we can reduce vehicle weight. That'll save on transportation. And um, if we have more efficient processes, that will help us save on these industrial processes. So these are, um, this is sort of a promo slide for stuff that I do at Ohio State. Then we work sometimes on processes that, that can help reduce vehicle weight. So we are sometimes trying to help with this big, big, big picture here and doing our very, very small part. The other place that manufacturing is a big deal is economic sustainability. If you actually look at where dollars come from and where they go, uh, our biggest export of dollars is for, for importing products from China and the Far East. And uh, if you look at this, uh, this is billions of dollars that exit the country per quarter. And we maxed out in 2008 about two hundred dollars two hundred billion dollars going out and the biggest part of that was actually uh, for manufactured goods that are coming in from other places oil is, is a big part of that uh, paying people uh, outside the country to, to be for example in military service is a big part but um, uh, manufacturing is a big big part of this and if we can locally manufacture we can capture that money and that's, I'm sure, the way the part, the way things are going, and you know, smaller volumes, more flexible plants are required. That's all kind of backgroundy information. So anyway, th this is where manufacturing is going, and um, you know, in the old, oldish days, still to now, this is what manufacturing looks like. We need tools and dies, which are uh, expensive to make. They go into these big presses, and there's factories that look like this all over the place. Um, and then you can squeeze metal into that, squeeze plastic into it, or there are new techniques coming up. Um, this is a MakerBot, one of the coolest things I think that come along in the last decade. These things are just getting, getting better, faster, cheaper. And what you can do in this case is take thermoplastics, melt them, and squirt them out where you need them, and uh, make parts directly that way. And uh, uh, you can't, can't make things quite as cheaply per part, but you can make them right where they're needed with very little waste, all local. Um, there's some cool things happening in this space that uh, can be truly revolutionary. So uh, that's something to work, look, look at. So anyway, just setting the stage that manufacturing is important. So I'm going to give again kind of a brief overview of all kinds of stuff that I think could be done in a ninth grade physical science classroom. And what we're going to talk about is really talking about making the stuff that we need every day. We'll talk about metals, talk about ceramics and glasses kind of together, talk about polymers, and the big two big classes of polymers are thermoplastics and thermosets. These are things like thermoplastics are things like wax and polyethylene. And the thing about wax and polyethylene what you can do is you can take them and melt them, resolidify them over and over and over again, and uh, they, they really, um, to, a, to a good extent, they don't they don't care. You can make keep making things. Thermosets are things like epoxy, which you may have bought from the hardware store. You mix up the two parts, the two resins react, crosslink, form this hard plastic, 
if you take that plastic and heat it up again it will not melt heat it enough it'll just burn um, things I won't talk about I won't talk about composites we could do a whole lecture on tools course on manufacturing composites we're not going to talk about electronic and functional materials which we could also talk about for a long time there's a lot more uh, in, in, in this case in particular but there's some really really cool interesting stuff because we are making these circuits um, we're on the head of a pin you might have thousands if not hundreds of thousands of transistors and this is all technology that's basically been developed over the course of my lifetime I'm a little over 50 but it's uh, you know radically radically interesting stuff that has um, truly changed the world in my uh, in my lifetime so um, and again making the point these geeky people that, that work work on these processes do change the world and uh, your students can be part of that next bit so let's go through metals um, and again this is going to be done in a survey type approach where do they come from basically rocks ores how do we make stuff well, there's three basic things we can do we can cast something basically heat the metal up let it solidify we've talked about this already this works nicely with phase diagrams we can take material and work it um, not talking about uh, modeling sort of stuff uh, but uh, meaning shaping it plastically rolling drawing stamping coining a whole bunch of processes and then you could machine it and I'm not going to say anything more about machining except to say yeah you can do that which machining is basically you know cutting taking a big block big block of something and then using tools to cut out whatever you need inside of it and and, and rescue that part uh, machining we do all the time a good way very good way to get highly precise parts but it's a fairly wasteful process because we're taking metal and turning it into chips if you can do something directly by casting or by forming it plastically these are much more efficient processes in the end they actually end up costing a lot less energy to make what we need so again this is something we talked about before and I think this is a great lab I'd love to see developed it's starting from malachite and, and we're doing this in our lab now make copper and we can do this from malachite we can make virgin metal from common ores as well um, and uh, that we're working on right now and out of this we can get a crucible and in that crucible we can get little bits of copper in the bottom take that copper and I think we can take that and prove that we can fashion that into things like wires measure the strength conductivity and so forth of that wire and I think that could make an outstanding series where we can show the chemistry that's into this show the properties of the wire put numbers against this um, and that's something that we're that I'd like to see us go towards so again um, the, the thing that I'll focus on here mostly is working stuff and when you're working stuff and you talk about something like wrought iron wrought is a tenth that we typically don't use much anymore but it's the past tense of work so wrought iron is work worked iron so we have work hardening happens during this and if we make a stress strain curve remember this is something that we could do with aluminum wires or, or other wires just on their own by hanging stuff from it we've done this in this series of lectures we can plot stress versus strain and most materials work harden meaning that the stress which is equal to force over area increases so as you're taking this thing and pulling on it volume is conserved so as you're pulling this way the cross section is decreasing but still at the same time the wire is getting stronger because you're doing something to the structure and so the strength ends up increasing and particularly the stress flow stress keeps up keeps increasing we can quantify this by making a percentage cold work and this is we we can take the area and we usually do this based on the areas you stretch it the volume is conserved so the area decreases so we can have a original area deformed area and by comparing those we can get a per percent cold work point is at this stage that we can quantify how much work we're putting into something and how much of an increase in strength therefore we can expect so there's a bunch of ways of doing this stretching things directly is the most uncommon way of doing it the really common ways of doing this are processes like forging which is taking a piece of metal 
squeezing it into a die with a force like this to make a shape that we're interested in. Rolling is another one that's very common. Just basically have two rolls, take a thick piece of metal, make thin metal out of it. That's the way we might like make something like aluminum, for example. Drawing, I think you've seen in the ASM class. Uh, we can take wire, bring it through draw plates that have progressively smaller openings, make finer and fire, finer wire this way. Or we can do extrusion, which is similar, except we can make, make much bigger reductions in one shot. We can also make some very interesting shapes all in one shot by, by doing something that isn't round at the end. And again, you're reducing the area. In all cases, when you plastically deform the metal like this, you're putting a whole bunch of defects called dislocations into the metal, and those dislocations are largely what give metal strength. A few dislocations are required to make metal deform. If you have lots of them, they get in the way of one another and uh, give, the metal, give the metal strength. And this is what dislocations look like. This is a titanium alloy after cold rolling. And these dislocations, again, I could spend a long time lecturing on them. I've got colleagues that have written entire books on dislocations. Basically, they're defects that allow deformation to take place. They can tangle with each other. Um, more of them are generated as you cold work. And that what, that's what makes the material stronger as you cold work, that the dislocations get in the way of one another. The material gets stronger and stronger as you work it. And so this is uh, an example with some steels. This is with no cold working, with 4% cold work, with 24% cold work. You can see that the initial, the initial strength, this is strength in megapascals, megapascals are millions of newtons per square meter. It's a megapascal. You can see this is fairly low strength, deforms at about 250 megapascals at first, put in 4% cold work. You're getting up to here where about 300 megapascals is required, put in 24%, you up here to where you know, about 600%, 600 megapascals are required to get the material to start flowing. So again, this is the same stress, strain diagram that we produced for wires earlier in the course. And then the other thing that you can do with metals is, is you can put heat into them after you've deformed them. And then what happens, you can get a process called recrystallization where these, where these, these grains are unstable that have all these dislocations in them. And you will form brand spanking new, very perfect grains. And these are initially small. They consume the slow, cold work crystal because the new ones have a smaller, lower energy. So new crystals nucleate after just three seconds at 580 degrees C. And this is for a brass, I believe. Yep, 33% cold work brass. And give it a little more time. After four seconds, you're seeing bigger uh, crystals. After eight seconds, a lot of them, and that's at a reasonably high temperature. But again, what it's showing is with the same composition, just by adding some temperature to it, we can cause the structure to change. That change in structure changes the strength pretty significantly. And uh, that's the core idea that I think you could do in, in ninth grade. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do with metals. Um, again, the ASM group of material exercises has a lot of things in it. We've talked about casting earlier, working through rolling. We can provide rolling mills, draw plates, and so forth. Uh, you can do that. Phase transformations fit into this nicely. Um, you can take something and, and work it, then anneal it to show you can bring the strength down again. Uh, we've shown we can make tensile tests, we can do toughness tests, basically a toughness test. Um, a real easy way to do this is you can instrument something with something called a Sharpie impact test where we basically take a little bar, looks like this, put a little notch in it, and then what we do is have a hammer that comes through, and the hammer is on a pendulum like this, it comes through. We can thwack this thing and then see how high the pendulum comes back on the other side. And that loss in height is basically how much energy was absorbed in breaking the bar. And that is another thing that could be very easily implemented. Very nice destructive demo you could do in a ninth grade classroom. Uh, with steels, we can make martensite. We can do nails. We can temper them or harden them. Some great stuff. These are also on the ASM thing. And then we also, the one I really like that I want to develop 
is you know, making wires from scratch, then developing in, them into uh, developing, making copper from scratch, making that into wires, making them into springs, and you could really feel some ownership, a lot like what was done in a toaster project um, book and videos and so forth. Okay, that's metals again. Very fast, um, over, very fast overview. Do the same thing with polymers and ceramics. Do some very fast overviews. Polymers are very different than metals and ceramics. I ask the question, how are they different? First of all, the, the structures are very, um, very disordered. Entropy tends to drive the structures. They're primarily amorphous. Entropy um, also is responsible for the uh, elasticity in elastomers. I'll talk a little bit about the full phenomenon is beyond I think what you could do in ninth grade but there's some very cool stuff related to that. Uh, mechanical behavior in polymers is strongly related to temperature and then probably the most important part of polymers that's why they're so dominant is it's really easy to form them particularly thermoplastics by injection molding them therefore they are cheap so if you go into Target, you'll find all kinds of plastic was injection molded in China. Happy Meal toys, which I think are kind of on the outs. Um, you know, our house was full of when we had small kids. Um, you know, injection molded, easy to make, very cheap, and that's one of the great, great things about polymers. So what what they look like? Is again, this is great chemistry. Um, it's carbon carbon bonding, and um, the suggestion was made in class that you know a lot of a lot of uh, biological structures, our polymers look a lot like this. This carbon-carbon bond is a really, really strong one. So in the case of polyethylene, it's just basically this chain of carbons. All the bonds are saturated by hydrogens on either side. You know, carbons on two sides, hydrogens on the other. And you can make these very, very long bonds with literally thousands or hundreds of thousands of units on these zigzag structures. This is polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride. We just have the occasional chloride ion kicking about in there. Polypropylene, We've got the CH3 three groups hanging out occasionally. And uh, these are all thermoplastics. And these things have a weak hydrogen bonding that makes one chain bond to the other. And these very, very strong covalent bonds act along the chains. And so what happens is when you heat them up to where they act liquidy, what you've done is basically melted the secondary bonds between chains, but the covalent bonding along the chain backbone remains very solid. So when you cool it back down again, everything goes back. You get the hydrogen bonds. The whole thing just comes right back um, as it was. And if you can align these very much so that you have all the, the uh, strong covalent bonds going the same direction, you can make very, very fine, very, very strong fibers. And there's a fiber called uh, Dyneema, which is basically polyethylene, where everything is very, very highly aligned to that direction. You can get remarkable properties out of this. Not as cheap as a milk jug, which is also polyethylene, uh, but, but a less expensive process there. So chain configurations, you can have linear. You can have branch chains, cross-linked, and as, you, as things cross-link, these secondary bonds now go, now go chain to chain, and this is what makes basically thermal sets. And so if you heat these things up, they might soften a little bit, but they will not melt. You can't reshape a thermoset polymer or something once it's cross-linked. Networks are similar, so these are also thermosets. So you can't process them quite the same way. Once you once you've made the the the, the polymer, it's it's done. Can't can't do no more. So here's uh, molecular weight and crystallinity. This is another thing that changes the uh, the, the the properties of the plastic. Um, you can have short molecular weights, long molecular weights. Milk jugs have fairly high molecular weights chemically very similar to a milk jug, which is polyethylene, is wax. Wax basically just has a smaller molecular weight. You've got shorter chains associated with it. Long chains to me, harder to untangle, harder to uh, slide. As a result, you get stronger stuff, you have more crystallinity. Things also tend to get 
uh, harder. And we won't deal too much about the crystalline, but the polymers have some very interesting structures and can have very regular regions within them. Again, stuff I won't talk too much about here. Um, a big thing that's common with polymers and glasses is that if you really crystallize something, imagine we're liquid, we have a specific volume, so is inverse of density, and you have a melting point. If we have something like aluminum, we hit the melting point, you're, you're cooling down from high temperature, you hit the melting point here, you go whomp down and your volume changes instantaneously as you go from liquid to solid at the melting temperature. That happens fairly instantly um, at that temperature as a first order phase transformation. The other thing that can happen is if you've got um, something like glass, you're cooling down, you hit the melting point, it may not be able to solidify for, for reasons that the, the chains get in their own way and they can't form that, that solid structure which is usually crystalline. So as a result of that you cool down, the viscosity increases and eventually eventually it kind of squeezes out what's called the free volume and your parent thermal expansion coefficient changes and you hit what's called a glass transition and the material becomes fairly glassy at that point. So polymers and glasses are things that have hard times solidifying. They you hit the melting temperature but they may not be able to solidify so they have this amorphous disordered structure that gets locked in and can become glassy. You get below the glass transition temperature and things can be um, can get below the glass transition temperature things are very hard. So polyethylene has very low glass transition temperature so at room temperature it's still pretty pliable. Some of these other materials like polycarbonate has a high glass transition temperature so at room temperature it's pretty darn stiff for example so that's how we end up you know varying the properties of, of polymers with, with temperature and we can control that and if you plot generally temperature versus molecular weight we can get a whole bunch of different kinds of behavior that come out of that that's part of why we like plastic so much we can go all the way from things that are very hard and structural uh, to things that are pliable like pleather uh, the, the plastic leather that was uh, in vogue when I was growing up um, and you know, fortunately we've kind of grown out of pleather, but uh, we still uh, still sometimes like to, to modify properties in that way. So um, again, the, the classification of polymers, how, do they, how does feed, heating affect structure? Well, you have thermoplastics, these are generally ductile, not cross-linked. They soften with heat, they're usually pretty recyclable. These are some examples. These are the um, recycling codes. Thermosets are not very easy to recycle. They're usually more hard, more brittle. They're cross-linked. They don't soften so much with heating. Um, they do soften some. And then these are some examples of thermosetting plastics. Big things, we, we need different processes to make these things. And, you know, the, the uh, automotive components are often thermosets. But thermoplastics are coming on with... Uh, uh, thermoplastics are coming on with composites as well. I'm going to stop, I'm not going to talk too much about drawing except to say we can line up these covalent bonds along a drawing direction, a stretching direction that can give you improved properties. Um, there's a lot of other ways we can fabricate uh, plastics that we'll get to in another slide or two. Um, before I, I do that, I'll talk a little bit about elastomers. Elastomers basically you have some cross links and a lot of slippage below between chains. You have these things above their glass transition temperature. As a result of that, you can make rubber bands, which are very stretchy. You can get huge amounts of strain, very, very low moduli associated with them. And uh, it's because of this chain structure and getting a lot of mobility between chains that, that makes that happen. And again, we could spend a lot of time on that. This is what I did want to get to, is kind of forming techniques. There's a lot you can do. If you have, um, if you have thermoplastics, you can injection mold or extrude, basically just squeeze stuff into a mold, squeeze stuff on an extruder to make uh, uh, things like um, uh, films and so forth, or, or, or fiber. Uh, here you can make anything you like, Happy Meal toys and the like. You can also do compression molding. Um, and all of these techniques basically you can do with thermoplastics or thermosets. If you're doing a thermoset, you've got to be a little more careful with the reaction kinetics. Make sure it reacts after it's out of the dye. Um, the way we make all kinds of jugs and all that is by blow molding. You injection mold with a process like this, a parison, then you take that parison, heat it up, 
blow some air into it and these materials um, the, by the viscous nature they have you can inflate them and make some cool shapes this way that's part of why we love plastic so much is great ways to make shapes with them very easily and of course that's a split mold that makes all that happen so again lots of experiments we can do with polymers um, shrinky dinks I love the shrinky dink experiment I think it's hard to explain the underlying physics at the ninth grade level but it has to do with with entropy um, drawing things back elastomer elasticity we can do some things with when you stretch a rubber band it becomes cold we can describe that by thermal uh, by thermodynamics again I think beyond ninth grade but we can think about glass transitions we can take things and cool them down below their glass transition temperature see if they get very brittle and so forth we can see solidification behavior of, of wax versus water uh, water you have, it's absolutely clear what's ice what's water if you're dealing with something like wax it's it's not so clear there's not this this this, this uh, clear phase boundary between it as you go through these uh, glass transitions and uh, um, and so forth we can do a lot with manufacturing and processes we can we can make things out of uh, make thermosets themselves for example nylon or epoxy we can foam plastics we can form thermoplastics um, there's a lot of great stuff where you can do hydrophilic versus hydrophobic um, diaper materials fake snow all these things and then um, the example I started with the maker bot is basically we have putting thermoplastic down in a shape that you're interested in there's a lot in the ASM group um, I don't think everything fits directly into ninth grade but but loads and loads do and there's lots of good stuff to be done and I look forward to discussion on what what one might do so I'm going to go through the polymer summary uh, basically not at all right now I'll let you read that on your own if you're interested move on to ceramics and glasses uh, ceramics and glasses is the last topic we'll deal with here they're different than metals and they have an, generally a fairly ionic crystal structure it depends on charge balance um, there's a lot of detailed chemistry that that gives the properties um, there's few dislocations dislocations can't move therefore they're brittle they're very uh, creep resistant but uh, you know, brittle means they don't absorb much energy if you drop them but at high temperature they're pretty good and we'll talk a little bit about how these are good for and how you can make ceramics and glasses basically I think I've gone through this before a ceramic is a compound basically it's a combination of a metal or non-metallic elemental solid and another non-metal or non-metallic elemental solid classic examples are things like silicon carbide alumina sodium chloride are, are good typical typical ceramics um, important point we talked about phase diagrams earlier ceramics use phase diagrams too exactly the same thing all the same phenomenology I taught you about phase diagrams or, or lectured about I should say with phase diagrams you can do with, um, uh, with with ceramics works just great very predictive same phenomenology works and then this is the difference between crystalline ceramics and, and glasses so silica SiO2 if it exists in a in a, in a ordered form we call that quartz it might look like this but what we can do is add modifiers to it impurities like this this makes it difficult to form that crystalline structure what we end up with is glass that looks like this glass sometimes we can poison it also things like uh, just oils from your hand will poison glass so it will crystallize like this and sometimes you'll see quartz lamps that people put in with their grubby oily hands you'll see frosted areas on them that's where it's become crystallized those frosted areas have a different coefficient of thermal expansion they don't conduct light very well they scatter light and once you see that starting to form it's not long before the uh, before that thing's gonna break because of differential thermal expansion but anyway you can have crystalline or glassy ceramics is the point we can control that through good material science same picture I showed you earlier if you have a glass it hits a melting temperature goes beyond that without really a, a discontinuous change in volume gets to a glass transition temperature there is a change in slope there as you run out of free volume and you get down below here things tend to be tend to be brittle 
and either one could happen as you cool something like silica SiO2 for example. I'm going to skip that. I meant to pull that slide out. But I did want to hit this. This is this is these are some of the great demos you can do with glasses. There's some wonderful demos you can do with glass. Um, one of the best ones, well, it, it, one of the best ones is called the Prince Rupert drop, and it, it goes on this on this approach, which I will explain. So Prince Rupert drop, what you can do is take a uh, glass rod, heat the end of it with a propane torch, good propane torch, put a flame on the end of this thing, and get it to drop like a gob, like this, hopefully make it look like a tadpole into a bucket of water and what happens is initially everything is hot this thing drops into the water the surfaces become very cool so the hot the, the, the surfaces become cool they contract get very hard but the inside is still warm and gooey and then the inside eventually cools down becomes hard and it shrinks later leaving the middle in tension the outside in compression and this is actually a really, really good state to be in because it's hard for a crack to start on the surface. So you could take that Prince Rupert drop and bang on the outside of it as hard as you want. You will not break it. Uh, but if you take this little t tail end and snap it off, basically it will shatter into a thousand pieces and um, because of the stored elastic energy that's in there. So the good news is this is a great way to suppress crack growth. We can either do this by this, this thermal tempering or we can we can change the chemistry on the surface of the glass versus the interior to give these uh, to, to give these these different stress states. So um, demos you can do with this. There's a bunch of these things. I'll let, leave you on your own. But but Prince Rupert drops tempered glass. What you can do is is uh, tempered glass is common. I think you've seen this in material science camp. Uh, very very uh, fracture resistant unless you unless you tap it on the edge, in which case it really goes in a hurry. Um, laminated glass, there's some great things you can do. Coring Museum of Glass has some wonderful demos. And then uh, Todd Bolenbaugh's um, YouTube site also has some great demos. This is great, great stuff that you can do along along these lines. Really compelling stuff. And, and, and they are, um, you know, not to make a glass pun, very transparent exercises in most cases. If you understand the idea of stress and how it works, this is good. This is good stuff. Um, there's some more decent YouTubes. I think a lot of those are the same, same topics. And then, you know, there's, there's fabrication methods for all of this stuff. So again, much like we did with uh, making polymers, this is a way we can make bottles and glasses and so forth. We can pr press a gob to make something called a parison. That parison gets suspended. You put gas in there and you blow up that like that. We can do fiber drawing. This is something that again could be done in your classroom. If you have moderate skills with a propane torch, you can do some incredible things in terms of, of uh, drawing glass. Um, Ohio is really, I think, the materials capital of the United States. Uh, Owens Corning has great things for gl glass fiber drawing. They've also done some neat things in sheet forming. Um, getting a molten glass, basically pick it up on a cooled roll and turn that into glass, temper it, and so forth. Uh, great practical stuff. If you want to do ceramics, this is where you could do some great uh, interchange with people in the art department. Slip casting is a way you can take these ceramic particles, make a shape out of them. Basically, you make a green shape, then you fire it on centering, take something that, that's uh, been dried out, and you end up get, turning that into a, a, a smaller, more dense, but much harder structure after you fire it. And you get very complicated systems after firing. Um, a lot of ceramics are also pressed. If you want higher density, you bake, make powders, press them together, start like this, and then you center them. Centering or firing is where you basically take these particles, which are just basically tacked together on heat. They try to reduce their surface energy, and they form structures like that. It looks like that. So you go from centering to make very dense parts in the end. So in summary, ceramics, also very cool. And there's some cool fabrication techniques that go with it and some very cool demos that you can do.
I won't go through that anymore. So, so anyway, he, here's a possible activity I think would be great at the ninth grade level. It actually could be done at the end of the year that um, uh, uh, pulls some things together. Um, so, and, and this illustrates really the design process, which is one of these parts of the uh, next generation science standards. It's a big deal. So what you can do is choose an interesting component, use the internet, figure out how it's made. And if you do anything uh, very careful, if you do have good internet access, there's usually all kinds of cool things on, on how it's made and so forth. And there's a lot of uh, what you could peel the onion way back on this and, and figure out where materials are sourced, how they work. There's chemistry beyond all of this. So trace back how it's made. How far back can you go? Could you go from you know, looking at a tire to tire cord to figuring out where the iron comes from, uh, how the iron turned into steel and so forth, and the steel belted radials. You can do that for the rubber component, all kinds of stuff. Then how? Then the next thing you do is how, you know, if you wanted something that's even better, what would you have to do to make that thing better, lighter, stronger? How would you do that? Would it take a more material, more expensive material or process? Lots of things you could do, including beverage containers, contact lenses, auto tires, fake skin, paper, concrete, gypsum, drywall, all kinds of things. And this reverse engineering, you know, is really reverse engineering the design process. This can tie back to chemistry process, I think show all the careers that are involved, the energies that are associated with it. And then uh, it's actually a pretty nice book. I've got a copy called Making It. It's just about three pages or so on, on um, about uh, probably 80 different processes, a lot of obscure, obscure ones included. Making it manufacturing techniques for product design by a guy named Lefteri. And um, there's others like that. And again, uh, websites like um, how it's made are, are fantastic in that as well. And I think that could be a very rich, interesting activity for a lot of kids. So again, this is where we started this lecturing, um, this lecture. All the physical we use is manufactured. It's a way of controlling shape, chemistry, microstructure all at once. Um, loads of skills are involved with that. Understanding materials is a key. This ties together all kinds of things in life. And I think it has, has room in the ninth grade. Hope we can find it together and we'll talk curriculum uh, when, we, when I see you next, I'm sure. That's it for now. Have a good week, and um, uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Keep that.